Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to be here and learn about uh, stellar dynamics of galactic center, which I, I want to emphasize is not my uh, domain of expertise. Uh, uh, I'd like to present some fairly re recent development in collisionless dynamics uh, that Pierre Henry has presented briefly to you, and uh, which was first carried out uh, by uh, my mentor uh, Jean Everts, and uh, more recently. Uh, been a topic of collaboration with uh, Jean-Baptiste, Pierre-Henri, John, James, and Simon. Uh, I'd like to stress that this is inspired by the published work of Martin Weinberg. Uh, so our, our work aims to understand the long-term evolution of self-gravitating system, uh, leading to, uh, for instance, radial migration and barrier crossing near a supermassive black hole. We rely on the novel equation uh, in this field that uh, Pierre-Henri has presented, the so-called uh, Balisculinar equation. Uh, and I am to show in this presentation that this equation provides a stochastic framework which can complement or rival possibly a classical uh, n-body framework. It opens in particular the possibility of following semi-analytically the complex project uh, dynamics of self-gravitating system over a, a long uh, time, a Hubble time in cosmology. And this is uh, unprecedented for a cold or tepid system. So I will go from the general to the particular and from galactic dynamics in the broad sense to the stellar dynamics of the nuclear clusters, which is the focus of this workshop, and hope to convince you that uh, these so-called kinetic theories uh, can address key questions in uh, galactic and nuclear dynamics. So as, uh, as uh, following the, the previous question, the origin of this equation arises from the transposition of Brownian motion in the context of self-gravitating systems. Since uh, the work of Einstein and Perrin, uh, we understand how ink diffuses in water, and the process reflects a very general principle in physics known as the uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem, which basically relates the rate of diffusion of something uh, to the uh, correlation of the fluctuating force responsible for the diffusion process. So the key idea is that typically uh, hydrodynamical and radiative processes uh, lock by symmetry self-gravitating systems into state of low entropy, where stars follow unlikely quasi-circular trajectories imposed by the mean field. And uh, I will show that through resonance, these stars can start to feel each other and eventually distort their own orbits. This corresponds to diffusion in orbital space. This is what we call uh, secular evolution, the slow process by which a self-gravitating system evolves towards a more likely state through fluctuations of the, of the potential. So as promised, I will start with galaxies in general, so as to later draw your attention to the specific of galactic centers, since in some sense the general problem is simpler than uh, the problem of the galactic uh, center. So we want to explain how this object will evolve uh, uh, on cosmological timescales through self-interaction of its component. So technically, our purpose is to explain uh, things like radial migration or and blurring and churning, in the context of the uh, Gaia mission or galactic archaeology or something, something people also call near-field cosmology. So a key property of thin galactic disks uh, such as NGC 891 is that its, its formation process has set it up into a dynamically improbable low entropy state of quasi-circular stellar orbits. And this is the result of shocks and radiation uh, coming from the fact that the stars were built from the, from the past gaseous component. So given a Hubble time, it can and will therefore easily adjust its uh, structure via resonant encounters so as, to, so as to explore more likely configuration. So the purpose of this talk is can we explain this from first principle? So for the sake of this work, I will consider the following idealized framework of a, of a thin and thick disk uh, embedded in a dark halo. And I will assume that gravity dominates the collisionless dynamical evolution of the stellar fluid. While this level of description is crude, the motion of the stars within such a system are complex, and this is something that we will need to address uh, in order to predict its long-term behavior. So how can we predict the self-interaction of these stars and on very long time scale? And the key here is to identify a recurrence uh, which will allow the perturbation to grow up, and that, that's through the, the resonance of the system. So I will also uh, obviously talk about the galactic center, and here, the motion of the S cluster uh, is Keplerian to first order, but we, may we, we may wonder what the effect of relativistic corrections uh, from the massive central object will do on long time scales and what the mass of the cluster itself will do on, on the evolution of the system. 
Uh, this is all the more important on galactic scales, on nuclear scales, because the orbital time is short. But on the other hand, the, the Keplerian potential is special. So a challenge in this context is to explain why uh, um, a black hole uh, doesn't eat too much of its environment, nor too little. So we have a fine-tuning problem of explaining what happens to the stars in its vicinity. So again, the abstraction will be the same. Well, I, well, uh, I, I'm going, to in fact, to focus on a, on a flattened stellar uh, cluster orbiting uh, uh, the black hole, which has replaced the bulge. And uh, the one novelty is that the potential is essentially Keplerian. And um, this involves an extra complication because it induces degenerate frequencies. Uh, so we'll have to circumvent this difficulty, uh, which is what is specific to uh, secular evolution in the galactic center. So if I have time, I'll say a few things about the situation where the black hole might be spinning or the stellar cluster might be uh, non-spherical in, in the vicinity of the black hole, which induces different secular motion for the, uh, the orbits in the vicinity of the black hole. OK, so let me recap. We want to understand uh, secular evolution, uh, the slow process by which uh, fluctuations of self-gravitating system evolve towards more likely state. So I'll divide my presentation in three parts. First, I'll motivate secular evolution, why secular evolution is relevant and discuss the key physical features uh, involved when one wants to describe the long-term evolution of self-gravitating system. This will be the core of uh, my talk. Then I'll present to you the corresponding equation that uh, you've already seen briefly and discuss it. And uh, I'll illustrate it on two examples, uh, the, the, the issue of radial migration in galactic disks uh, as a proof of concept with uh, quantitative comparisons with simulations. Um, and then I'll end up with the focus of what's of interest to this audience, which is the secular evolution of a quasi-Keplerian system uh, and um, see how this corresponds to a, a degenerate case of the general theory. So in, in this talk, we're concerned with understanding how a stable self-gravitating system uh, responds over long time scales. And so one question we may ask is, uh, how can a galaxy evolve along the Hubble sequence uh, through uh, its uh, self-interaction? So we're here in the process of trying to disentangle nature and nurture, nature being um, its internal uh, driven evolution and nurture being uh, the impact of the its cosmic environment. And so I'll focus on, uh, I guess, the nature in this talk. Uh, and the motivation is uh, chemodynamics, etc. And so our task is to build, oops, our task is to build uh, the corresponding uh, quasi-linear theory, which should be valid for time scales uh, which are much longer than a typical dynamical time scale. And uh, as we will see, uh, the secular evolution will be driven by resonant e effects, uh, which distort the orbital structure. So basically, the, four the five points I want to make in this first part of my talk is that galaxies disk have a uh, uh, specific features which are, are of relevant for uh, long time scales. They're inhomogeneous, uh, as mentioned already by uh, Pierre Henry. Um, they're um, multi periodic and phase mixed. They're self gravitating, and this is will be a very important point for disks and also for the galactic center, as I will try to argue. And they, uh, they can be embedded in a cosmic environment, and they're made of a finite number of particles. This is true both for this, where you have uh, GMCs, but also in the context of the galactic center, where you have a finite number of stars orbiting the, the black hole, the central black hole. So the, the typical trajectories of um, uh, stars in a, in a galactic disk are quite intricate. And so in order to understand how the self-interaction of such stars describing their orbit can drive the, the orbital structure of the system away from its state of equi equilibrium, we need to uh, look at, uh, have a statistical approach and look at the evolution of the distribution function. Uh, and so we, make, we need to make sense of these complicated trajectories. So this, uh, this can be done uh, by uh, uh, introducing um, so-called angle action coordinates, which are in some sense for those of you familiar with the Lenné variables are a sort of generalization in the context of galactic dynamics of uh, the Lenné variables. So taking the example of a pendulum, um, uh, if we want to uh, describe the dynamics of a linearized pendulum in configuration space, uh, we're better off moving to a uh, phase space. 
where uh, basically uh, in phase space the trajectory is uh, are labeled by the area of the uh, um, um, tra trajectory in phase space and the position of the pendulum is represented by the angle. So uh, if I use these new canonical coordinates as a representation of my system, uh, then um, um, because the uh, area is a constant of the motion, uh, the uh, Hamil Hamilton's equation trivially becomes straight line in uh, angle action space. Uh, and so this allows me basically to, uh, to uh, uh, recover uh, the um, uniform medium description that uh, Pierre-Henri has been describing previously. And so it, it enlights also the specific role of uh, the frequencies, which are just simply the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the actions. And something, uh, so it's, it's rather boring in 1D, but something quite interesting happens if you consider a 2D pendulum, so two strings attached together and a one cycle string. So this, this linear 2D um, oscillator will behave like the uh, direct product of two uh, 1D oscillators. And so in phase space, the typical trajectory of uh, the pendulum will be a trajectory along a torus. And uh, one of two things can happen depending on the length of the strings uh, of your pendulum. Either it leads to uh, frequencies which are commensurate, so there's an integer number relating the two frequencies, in which case the um, trajectories will uh, uh, describe a, 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 a trajectory of zero measure uh, in the, on the tori, or they're non-resonant, and then uh, the, tra the trajectory will fill the torus. And so you see that from the point of view of recurrence, this, is a, this makes a big difference. So if, if I choose two frequencies which are not commensurate here on this 2D pendulum, uh, and I ask myself, how often do the blue, the blue particle meet the red particle? When they're not resonant, it happens quite rarely. Whereas conversely, if I consider the situation where there is a commensurability, then the likelihood of um, having a recurrent uh, meeting uh, between the blue and the red particle uh, augment uh, s considerably. So you see why uh, uh, recurrence is driven by resonance, which is driven itself by uh, the, 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 fr the natural frequency of the system. Um, so if I use this action back to this angle action variable back on my galaxy, then I, I, I by going to phase space, I can see that I can easily label the orbits uh, using um, uh, these, these actions. Um, uh, this is VR versus R and VZ versus Z in, in phase space. And so then the question of how does the distribution function of my system evolve with cosmic time uh, becomes a uh, question of how do these uh, actions get distorted by the diffusion process. And so the, uh, the answer uh, uh, is through dressed resonant interaction, which is what we're going to see. So let me uh, uh, move a bit more quickly on the more trivial uh, points I want to raise. So galaxies are relaxed, uh, and everybody knows that um, first through violent relaxation, the potential becomes time independent, and then through phase mixing, the distribution function uh, loses track of its angle and depends only on the actions. So we're really interested in, in writing a, an equation for the evolution of the distribution function as a function of actions only. Uh, galaxies are self-gravitating, which means that if I have a leading spiral and I let it unwind, it will be strongly amplified by a factor of more than 100 for a mestel type disk. And this will play a key role in, uh, in um, <coughs> secular evolution because this amplification will be squared. Uh, uh, Pierre-Henri already mentioned the fact that the, 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 the gravitational susceptibility is squared in uh, diffusion equations. So you get a factor of 10,000. So the way you deal technically with this amplification is by using uh, a potential uh, density basis introduced by Carl Nye. So you, you basically make the field equation disappear by projecting the response of the system over a basis which automatically satisfies Poisson's equation. So by magic, you don't have Poisson's equation anymore. The price you pay is that you have a matrix to keep track of the, the, the time evolution of these time-dependent coefficients. So this is uh, explained here, and I guess I don't need to uh, enter into the details. It involves this matrix, uh, response matrix introduced by Carl Nice, which involves this resonant denominator. Again, the relevance of the resonance in this problem. And uh, importantly, uh, uh, the, the, the gravitational wake or the gravitational susceptibility involves uh, the inverse of this uh, matrix response. So when it has a one as an eigenvalue, you see that the system can uh, 
uh, amplify uh, exponentially uh, its uh, perturbation. So in the context of secular evolution, we assume it's not the case, but it can be close to one, so the amplification can be quite strong. Uh, galaxies are perturbed, so they're embedded into a, a cosmic environment, which is going to uh, act as a source of potential fluctuations, which can also drive diffusion, but I guess this will not be the topic of this talk. And uh, galaxies are subject to their own graininess. So as, as Pierre-Henri has shown you, the, the, the distribution function is sourced by a uh, ballet school in our type of operator, which involves one over n, n being the number of particles in your system in the, uh, as a departure from the mean field limit. If you've got an infinite number of stars, this term is zero, but here we're interested in finite system made of a finite of, uh, number of particles. Okay. So let me give you an example to be more concrete. This is a numerical experiment done by Jerry Selwood in, uh, in uh, 2012, where he considers a, a built-to-be stable uh, mestel disk with half a billion uh, particle, and he lets it evolve over many dynamical time. And so this is the uh, initial configuration in, uh, uh, angle ac in uh, action space. So you have uh, an excess of... Uh, stars corresponding to this surface density here, and this is not working anymore. And uh, after uh, many dynamical time, you see this feature which is emerging spontaneously within the system, even though it was built to be stable, so in principle nothing should happen. So you see uh, an appearance of an excess of eccentric orbit and a depletion of circular orbits uh, in the vicinity of the maximum of the distribution function uh, in action space. So this is secular evolution. Uh, if you look at configuration space, this is us reproducing this experiment, you see that nothing, happen nothing is happening at all. The, the, the disk is just happily rotating and, and forming weak transient spiral which disappears. Uh, but if you move to uh, angle action space, you see uh, with this uh, animation that I, I don't know how to slow down. So every, every time the it runs, it's a Hubble time. So <laughs> and you see the appearance of this ridge, uh, which can be seen also on this static. Uh, representation of action space. So secular evolution is about the distortion of the orbits induced by their self-interaction. And this is a 1 over n effect as shown by uh, Selwood again because if you increase the number of particles in the, in the run you see that uh, the, the, the time it takes for this uh, ridge to appear uh, goes like 1 over n. So why not? Well, it depends on n. Depends what system you're looking at. Yes. Yes. And in the galactic center, n is not one billion, for instance. So, in Selwood's experiment, the time it builds uh, is uh, is uh, is commensurable or the order of uh, Hubble time. But this was meant to be. Uh, um, uh, how do you say, an abstract experiment. So the, the, the in the real case, it depends what n is, if it's the number of molecular cloud in the system. Because of the factor of uh, 10,000 I'm talking about, it will grow much faster than uh, what you would naively think. Uh, shall I continue? I just meant that something stars can exist. Yes, then I agree with you. Um, so... So this is a cartoon of what's happening. You have your initial condition, uh, violent relaxation. You reach a crazy stationary state, and depending on uh, uh, on the properties of the the system and the number of particles, it can evolve towards uh, either an unstable regime or um, to a new equilibrium through secular evolution. Um, Okay, so let me just present to you the equation. I, I won't spend much time because it's already been done in part by uh, Pierre-Henri. Uh, it's uh, supposed to describe uh, finite n effects on long-term evolution of self-gravitating system, which are inhomogeneous, stable, self-gravitating, isolated, and discrete. There's some literature starting from uh, Balescu and Lenard in the 60s, and I guess the uh, uh, first, first presentation was done by uh, Jean Evers in 2010. And uh, we and others have been working on it since. So this is the equation. It's an equation which involves uh, uh, the dif uh, divergence of a flux. So it's a conservative. It's, it goes like 1 over n. Uh, it involves the square of the uh, distribution function because it requires the coincidence to happen. 
these, uh, these um, coincidences are uh, amplified by one over the susceptibility of the, your gravitational system squ squared. And uh, you require that the, r the stars involved are resonating. And you sum over all possible resonances. I'll come back to this. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, so you have these resonance condition. And this is, this is the master equation describing uh, self-induced orbital distortion, uh, f such as uh, um, uh, um, what is it called? orbital rela relaxation. No, the paper by Scott and Hal, what is it called? <laughs> Don't know. Resonant relaxation, sorry. <laughs> uh, re resonant relaxation. Uh, so the idea behind resonant relaxation is um, the, it comes from this condition of resonance um, that you have to impose. Let's, let's ask ourselves what uh, star blue and red are doing and move to a co-rotating frame so that within that co-rotating frame, both uh, the blue and the red orbit close either at, as an inner limb blad or as a co-rotation resonance. And you see that in this co-rotating frame, uh, they will be able to exchange some angular momentum and, and in this process, uh, restructure their, their, their actions. So this is, this is what happens in the co-rotating frame. Uh, the two orbits uh, uh, satisfy the condition of resonance. And in that frame, uh, they, they can exchange some torque. And through torquing, they can change their actions and so allow the uh, orbital structure of the system to diffuse. Um, so this is uh, another representation. Uh, if the two stars are not resonating, then um, uh, they don't exert any torque on each other because they're actu actually, actually s distributed. But if they do resonate, then they can apply some torque on each other. And so resonance drives the recurrence and drives the, uh, the ability for the system to evolve. Uh, now, if I focus specifically on um, uh, fluctuation-driven uh, evolution, and I look at action space, uh, and I look at some uh, the distribution function and, and its fluctuation at a given time. If the blue fluctuation happens to uh, resonate with the red fluctuation, meaning that they are uh, they are sitting on lines of constant uh, m dot omega, which uh, which match each other, then uh, these fluctuation can uh, gravitationally talk each other and amplify themselves, uh, and this is what driving the secular evolution. Is that clear to everyone? Because this is sort of key. No? Yes? Maybe? <laughs> so the, 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 the coupling that can occur through this resonant condition allows this, this uh, pert uh, short noise perturbation to be gravitationally amplified by the, by the square of the uh, gravitational susceptibility. So for cold mestel disk, that would be a factor of 10,000. Uh, okay, so how do, you, how do you deal with the actual implementation? Because it's one thing to write an equation, but then you actually need to implement it. So you have to deal with the fact that the system is inhomogeneous, long-range, self-gravitating, and you need to deal with these Dirac's. So that's, that's the hard part. Uh, so what you do is you use uh, angle action to, um, to uh, deal with the homogeneity. Uh, you project uh, the Poisson equation over the basis function to deal with the long range. You, uh, you use numerical linear theory to compute the matrix response, and that's, that's a big piece of work. And you integrate along the resonant line, so I won't go into the details because it's technical and uh, a bit boring, but you have to keep in mind that you need to integrate twice over phase space, so there's no free lunch, and uh, that's where the, the, s the cost is going. Uh. But it's doable, uh, and uh, so it's the topic of Jean-Baptiste's PhD. <laughs> uh, and so um, let me now uh, uh, illustrate briefly. How much time do I have? Sorry? Really? <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, usually I have minus 20 minutes at this stage. Uh, OK, let me slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe it will be better for everyone. Um, so let's move to the uh, understanding what happens to, uh, to the, uh, the, st the cold stellar disk. So the structure of the equation is, uh, is a diffusion equation uh, with a flux which involves the sum over resonances. So um, this is sort of what, which what led us to, uh, to address this problem when, we saw, uh, when I saw uh, uh, the, the paper by uh, Jerry Sawood that the fact that the ridge seems to be specifically along the inner limb resonance 
suggested that uh, um, it, it must be a resonantly driven process uh, which is responsible for the uh, secular evolution. So what you see here is that these the stars which were initially here uh, are going to be the inner limb blood resonance with itself. There's no uh, there with the excess of uh, of uh, orbits in this area, which allows them to communicate by inner limb blood resonance. No, it's not. Um, okay, um, it's a good question, and there's a good answer, but I'm really jet lagged, so give me, <laughs> let me think. Uh, but uh, but you don't have to have something to resonate. Sorry, <laughs> for twelve minutes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is uh, this is um, uh, again from Jerry Selwood, uh, a representation of the fact that you have a po positive flux uh, in this part of uh, action space and a depletion here. And this is the result of the uh, ballis culinar implementation, uh, where you compute the, uh, the, the divergence of the, the flux through the matrix response. So you see that qualitatively, at least, and to some extent quantitatively, you do recover through the formalism the fact that you have uh, diffusion along the, 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 the correct ridge. Uh, so this, uh, this solves a, a long-standing puzzle in galactic dynamics because for a long time people had been claiming that it was a sequence of uh, swing amplified uh, response which was generating a ridge which itself was triggering the next sequence of swing amplified uh, spirals and that was the ongoing process. Uh, what we show here and what has been uh, sh also shown independently by Jerry is this can't be the case because the formalism assumes that the uh, swing amplification uh, are decorrelated. So the in, in the, uh, the uh, Balisculenar uh, formalism, um, there's, no, there's no correlation between the, the uh, swing amplified response. And uh, Jerry has also uh, reached this conclusion because uh, in his experiment, he, uh, he after each uh, 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 spiral am amplification, he, he am azimuthally averaged the uh, the, the disk in order to, to kill uh, any correlation if there was any and he would still see the same uh, growth uh, of uh, structure of this uh, region in action space. Uh, one thing we can do is check that the scaling we get uh, uh, as a function of, um, of the fluctuation of the distribution function uh, with both time and the number of particle is consistent with uh, 1 over n effect uh, so with uh, uh, the dissipation uh, fluctuation theorem. So we expand uh, the, the, the variance of the fluctuation of the distribution function. And the theory tells you that you should have a contribution which goes like the initial shot noise and then 1 over n squared coming from the collisional uh, ballis culinar equation. And this is what you measure. So it's in good agreement by doing many such, such simulations. And if you measure the time scale at, at which this uh, perturbation builds up, the ridge uh, grows into the, the disk, uh, uh, the uh, ballis culinar uh, calculation is also consistent uh, within a, uh, with the, uh, what's measured in the simulation. And this is thanks to this uh, gravitational susceptibility or the gravitational wake, which is squared in the equation. And you get a factor of 10,000. If you don't account for the gravitational amplification, which you can do with such a uh, semi-analytic uh, system, so you can turn off the collective effects by just uh, putting m to 0 in the, in the equations, then you see that you don't, uh, you don't get the time scales and you don't develop the ridge. And similarly, you can convince yourself that it's truly the swing amplification process which is responsible for the... Uh, uh, for the formation of the ridge because if you kill in your basis function the, the unwind uh, basis, so you only le leave the WKB-like basis, then you also uh, kill the formation of the ridge. Uh, so I guess this, I, sh I want to emphasize this is one uh, of the nice thing about having a anal semi-analytical formalism is you can play with these things, you can switch certain things off and see what, what it does, which is much more difficult in the context of an n-body code. Yes. Yes. This is the second plot. This one. 
I want you to see that you don't have a nice ridge. What is the structure that you do here above the entrance and the entrance? It's, it's essentially noise. It's, uh, it's small amplitude, and it doesn't have the right time scale. Okay, so it's just, you're still getting the blurry. You're getting the, uh, well, I have a few slides where we did this, the WKB, uh, with a WKB approach. So that would be exactly this. And uh, I, can, uh, I can show you later. It's, you don't get the, sh if you have only WKB basis, uh, uh, then you won't get a, a nice sharp ridge. You get a depletion and um, an excess of eccentric orbits, but not uh, at the, uh, roughly in the right region. So it's capturing some of the process, but not the right amplitude and the right sharpness, and not the right time scale as well. Uh, what's interesting and also noticed by Selwood is that if you let this system long enough, uh, it will actually do something uh, uh, unexpected is after a long secular time scale, it will actually start to grow exponentially again if you look at the fluctuations. So the system uh, has actually uh, uh, used uh, the fact that uh, uh, orbits can resonate with each other to find a new state of equilibrium where it's now uh, Vlasov unstable. And so it can rearrange, uh, redistribute its angular momentum much more effectively thanks to the fact that it's built this bridge. How much time do I have now? 13 minutes? Okay. Uh, so this is, was also noticed by Selwood. This is the uh, collisional regime, uh, and then you have a phase transition and unstable Vlasov stage. Since I have a bit more time, uh, uh, so this car dislikes so much the state in which they were formed that they drive themselves slowly into a new state where they can just redistribute violently their angular momentum through an instability. Uh, which is quite interesting because in the uh, 70s, uh, uh, Lyndon Bell wrote a paper on the so-called tumbling instability where you ask yourself how does a, uh, such a nice ellipses uh, align each other uh, if you assume that they all have a, they have a certain distribution of angular frequency. And you can write down uh, the equivalent of genes instability uh, for the, uh, the analog of a genes instability, for an, which corresponds to an azimutal instability of these uh, ellipses aligning each other. And it will happen if the, uh, the temperature, so to speak, in the, in the distribution of angular frequency is sufficiently narrow so that gravity overtakes uh, inertia or, or heat content, if you prefer. And uh, I, I'm guessing, I haven't proven this, but I'm guessing this is uh, this is exactly what's happening here because we are on this ridge, which is essentially at a very narrow distribution of angular frequency. So it's, it's, it's almost a test case for uh, Lyndon Bell's scenario of 79, of this tumbling instability. Okay, so I should move on to the galactic center. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. So it's back to your. So uh, we looked at this, and uh, we lo we did a multi-species analysis where you would have a, a large number of stars and a much smaller number of molecular clouds, and then the molecular clouds are actually running the show, and I think. Uh, at the level of order of magnitude, uh, the number of molecular clouds we had were, were numerous enough or low enough. The fraction of the mass of the molecular clouds, what did we have? Um, I don't remember. Uh, it's not our strong point, let's put it this way. When, when I'm not trying to convince you this is, this is relevant to, uh, to galactic dynamics as such. It's just an illustration of yeah. why the formalism works and we're comparing to an experiment. Um, So thank you for, s for asking this. this uh, I completely forgot to make this point. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so what you're seeing, what you're seeing uh, the, the, this, the formation of this ridge is exactly the process of churning and blurring at the same time, right? Blurring would be uh, moving up, and churning would be moving uh, along the x-axis, and we have a... Uh, um
Uh, can I use again my uh, jet lag <laughs> argument? Or <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Do you need to? <laughs> That would be uh, that would be impulsive uh, heating, uh, so not described by resonant relaxation, uh, but described by the equivalent of two-body relaxation. So it's a, it would be another source of heating. If you write down the Langevin equation uh, corresponding to uh, uh, ballet you would uh, you would need to add a new diffusive term uh, coming from this source of heat. A small fraction of. Okay, so galactic center. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to now transpose the general result to the the case of the galactic center. So the thing which changes is the potential, uh, and the fact that the potential is Keplerian means the frequencies are, are identical. So uh, in principle, I have a problem in my equations because I have a Dirac with the resonant condition, so I'm going to have a Dirac with zero inside. So the way out is to, um, uh, well, you know about galactic centers. The way out is to uh, uh, basically do an orbit average before you derive the equation, or as you derive the equation, and then uh, then you end up with exactly the same uh, equation as before, except that um, uh, the distribution function you, you have to consider is the uh, uh, average over the fast angle of the uh, um, initial distribution function. So uh, you use uh, the, co the relevant uh, angle action variables for the Kepler problem, which are the Lenné variables. So each orbit is characterized by both by its action and by its, its slow angle corresponding to the um, orientation of the ellipse, and uh, you have a, a source of precession corresponding to the coupling between the orbit, which is driven both by the self-gravity potential of the fact that there is some mass in the distribution of uh, orbits, and uh, terms corresponding either to the external cluster or to the relativistic corrections. So these are my new frequencies, and I can have uh, two situations, either uh, um, I have in-plane precession or out-of-plane precession, depending on the nature of the environment. Is my black hole uh, rotating or not? Is my, st is my external cluster spherical or not? And um, uh, I guess, well, you know this better than me, so uh, let me just skip this. So this is the equation, of same, exactly the same equation as previously, except this time uh, I have bars, which means that I have average over the fast angle. And so the question here is, is a fluctuation in the number of uh, wires uh, at, at this frequency um, uh, allowed to talk to another fluctuation uh, at the same resonant frequency so that the, uh, the, the two ellipses, set of ellipses can talk each other through the uh, variation of the potential due to the relativistic effect of the black hole and the mass in the disk. So uh, this is nice because it explains quite naturally uh, the, uh, the emergence of a, a Schwarzschild barrier because for the process to uh, work, we need to have a coincidence of uh, orbits which have the same uh, frequency. So if I, have, if I am uh, far enough from the black hole so that I have a frequency which is below the, the local maximum here of the frequency as a function of radius, which is dominated by the disk in this region and dominated by the black hole here, then uh, I can find pairs of uh, wires which can talk to each other. But as I reach uh, uh, an, a re an inner region such that um, uh, I can't find any more pairs of orbit to talk to each other, then uh, the diffusion process stops and the diffusion coefficient uh, become uh, zero. And so I, I recover very naturally the Schwarzschild barrier with the ballis in the context of uh, uh, galactic centers.
because they uh, they don't have anybody else to talk to. They need to talk to someone else. And Yes. One minute. Uh, so I can write uh, the corresponding Langevin equation, which is a classical trick of transforming a focal planck like equation into uh, uh, the equation for the underlying uh, particles, if you want, uh, which is driven by a stochastic uh, force and which involves the square root of the diffusion coefficient as a, as a driving uh, prefactor for the stochastic force. And so in this formulation, uh, then uh, depending on whether my two s uh, uh, set of Ys are resonating or not, uh, they will be able to, uh, to talk to each other or not. And so you see uh, in uh, here the Schwarzschild barrier here corresponding to the fact that the frequency is becoming uh, too high. And uh, two more slides. Uh, so this is an implementation, uh, once again, of the full formalism in the context of the Kepler problem. So here I'm looking at, uh, again, a map uh, representing the depletion and excess of uh, uh, Ys uh, induced by the diffusion process uh, as uh, computed by, implement by computing the diffusion coefficient of the ballet coulinard equation. So you, you find the, the known result that uh, the um, semi-major axis is uh, adiabatically invariant and you have an increase in eccentricity uh, due to the fact that some of the orbits are going to uh, talk each other. And if I do a Langevin implementation of this, then I, I will find the same process of the fact that my initial distribution of stars will uh, broaden itself and uh, the diffusion process will stop at the Schwarzschild barrier imposed by the, the presence of the black hole. And so I believe, but uh, this is a... Uh, last night's uh, lack of uh, sleep because of jet lag, that this is, uh, this is quite relevant to the, uh, the talk of uh, Anne-Marie uh, yesterday uh, where she was looking at this eccentric disk and finding that the, the self-interaction of, uh, of the Ys uh, would allow them to pump, out, pump up eccentricity and, uh, and trigger uh, um, tidal disruption. What's the last acronym? It's an acronym with three letters, tidal event. Uh, uh, but, um, and so uh, uh, what's important here is that in the ballet culinaire formalism, uh, you have this uh, gravitational amplification uh, coming from the gravitational wake of the orbit. So if your disk is sufficiently massive, and she had a disk which was not, uh, uh, which had a mass which was not negligible compared to the disk, then this process of uh, eccentricity pumping will be strongly boosted by the, the self-interaction of the orbit. So uh, um, I guess this is something to be discussed. And uh, sorry, and my last slide. Uh, the ballet culinaire equation can be revisited uh, by uh, uh, looking at multi-species. And so if I ask myself what happens to a set of orbits like this, and I have light and, uh, and massive uh, wires or stars describing the, the ellipses, then uh, the diffusion process tells you that the, the more massive, uh, the lighter uh, wires which actually diffuse more radially. So what the, the equation predicts is that uh, it's, the, uh, it's the lighter stars uh, which are going to be swallowed before the the, ma the massive one because everything is done at uh, constant uh, fast action. And so uh, this is uh, 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 not unexpected, but it's the, co the opposite of what people expect when they think about globular cluster. Mass segregation actually segregates the lighter stars near the black hole, not the more massive one, if you, if you uh, are driven by a resonant relaxation and not by two-body relaxation. And so maybe... Uh, <laughs> if a uh, jet lag doesn't uh, make a fool of me, uh <laughs> a prediction would be that uh, if she, if uh, Anne Marie uh, looks at, uh, um, uh, makes their experiment with a set of different masses, maybe she's already done this, <laughs> uh, <laughs> she would find that uh, it's the lighter stars which are being uh, disrupted first. Uh, and so let me conclude. Uh, the uh, Thanks to the ballet culinar equation, the stellar dynamic and nuclear dynamic can describe uh, statistically the long-term evolution of, uh, 
uh, self-gravitating system um, through resonant relaxation. Uh, if you put this together with, uh, with a Foucault-Planck equation describing the environment, you should be able to, uh, to break uh, the uh, conundrum of nature versus nurture in self-gravitating system. And uh, I've presented you, I think, uh, what is the first two, the first two implementation of Bade school in our equation in astrophysics. And uh, I hope to have convinced you that it's complementary to uh, N-body method and Monte Carlo method. And let me finish here.